So, Karl Marx, writing in poverty not far from here in Soho, once remarked that no one had ever written about money so much who had so little. Um, I think is very appropriate. But he went on to say something else. He said that not even love has made so many fools of men as the pondering over the nature of money. And I think this is really the starting point for our talk, to try and understand this thing that seems to kind of rule over us under society as it stands, you know. Uh, it's always had a, a kind of revered place in history, money has. You know, the Bible obviously talks about how money is the root of all evil. It seems to be a kind of mystical force. And in society today, all our needs seem to be relegated to the need for money. But there are a lot of kind of, there are a lot of revered idols in class society. You have the law, gods, you know, the state, religion. All of these sorts of things are revered under class society. All seem to be quite mystical, like money. But I would say all of these things, including money, if you look with a Marxist analysis at these things, that is to say, in a dialectical and a materialist way, you can strip away the mysticism and understand what really lies underneath. If we look at the origins, the evolution and the development of money over history, we can understand also where it might head in the future. And most importantly, how we get rid of this kind of uh, chain of gold that seems to hold us down under society at the moment. Now, Marx actually explained in his writings in Capital at the end of chapter two, I believe, he said that really the riddle of the money fetish is the riddle of the commodity fetish. And in other words, capitalism is this system of commodity production and exchange, a generalized commodity production exchange. And if you can understand uh, that, if you can understand how the commodity arises and what role commodities play within society, then you can understand why money arises and what role money plays. And Marx said, if you understand that, then further analysis is really left just to looking at the different forms of money, whether it's cash or coins or credit or these days cryptocurrencies. Now, with that in mind, if we study history, we see that money has not always existed, but is in fact tied precisely to the arising of commodity production and exchange. In the early days of humanity, society wasn't split into classes where you had exploiters and exploited, but it was based more on tribes where there was communal ownership over the tools and the products within society. Marx and Engels referred to this as primitive communism. Communism in the sense that there was a common ownership over the means of production, as they called it, but primitive in the sense that it was on a much lower level of uh, production. In fact, it was based on scarcity, not like communism in the future, which will ba be based on superabundance. But within that common ownership, you had n uh, no exchange between individuals. Things were just taken from the common pot and contributed to a common pot. And therefore, because there was no exchange, no commodity production, you had no need for money. And this is also true of the earliest forms of civilization. If you look at where civilization began in Mesopotamia, it began with these kind of giant city-states. And, uh, and within those city-states, there was, again, there was no real exchange going on. Instead, produce was uh, deposited at temples and uh, the kind of original banks, really, uh, storehouses in the royal temples or palaces. And, uh, and, and instead, the economy was kind of bureaucratically planned from the top down uh, with a system of management and accounting. People would store this stuff at these communal stores and, uh, and th that was noted down on tablets, uh, inscribed tablets. It's actually where mathematics began as a result. And often, you know, this can be compared really, if you like, to the kind of accounting and management that goes on today within a giant firm, you know, in a, in a, within any big multinational firm. You don't have money changing hands. It's just a question of bookkeeping. And again, this gives us a hint as to the role of money within society and how it might uh, wither away in the future. Money then historically arises with the arising of commodity production and exchange, and particularly obviously the question of trade. It's uh, commodities, as I said, are production not for the individual, not for the, your own subsistence. A commodity is something that's produced for exchange, for the market, for trade, exchange with others. And therefore, Commodity production exchange begins at the fringes of society, whereas originally you had, as I say, these kind of primitive communism, 
the beginnings of money are the beginnings of trade between different tribes where they start to trade their surplus at the fringe of society with other tribes. But what Marx and Engels noted was that once this logic uh, had kind of, or rather once this process had begun, it kind of took on a logic of its own. And the, uh, the relationship between different tribes of, of around commodity production exchange would start to kind of be internalized within the tribe. And, uh, and this is what Engels writes about in his book on the origins of family private property in the state, where he talks about the early um, uh, Greek gens, as they were called, the early Greek tribes, where he says, as they began to uh, develop commodities and, and trade, uh, then this would penetrate like a corrosive acid, he said, dissolving all the old communal traditions, laws and bonds. And uh, in other words, uh, as, as you started trading more externally and thinking of products in terms of commodities, the more that would start to be internalized within the community and you would get the arising of laws that sanctified private property and that, that kind of um, set this, uh, these relationships into stone, quite literally often. And as the division of labor within society increased, the, uh, the, 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 the amount of commodity production and exchange uh, increases also. Um, and you have, uh, with this process, comes also the formation of debts, of usury, of uh, these sorts of things, which have really gone on since the dawn then of civilization. It's not some, uh, some sort of tumor that arises under capitalism. Um, and with those debts and usury, with the lending, you, uh, you get obviously accumulation at one pole and enslavement at the other. And this is really, as I say, the beginning of class society. Now, within this process that's going on uh, of trade, of, of commodity production exchange, there arises a need, really, a practical need, for one commodity that can be seen as some sort of universal equivalent, um, again, a commodity against which all others can be compared, something that's basically like a yardstick of, uh, of value, of how different commodities can be compared with, with one another. And it's this universal equivalent that is the beginnings of money, and, and is the money commodity, Marx calls it. It acts as a means of exchange, of allowing people to obviously trade over much larger distances. Rather than obviously having to meet and barter, you can separate exchange into two acts, <coughs> uh, a purchase and a sale, or a sale and a purchase, depending on which way you're looking at it. And uh, in this sense, it's, it, money is, is, is a means of exchange, a means of circulation, a means of allowing commodities <coughs> to, uh, to circulate around without having to be uh, directly traded. But also money plays the role of uh, a unit of account, if you like. It's a way, as I say, of comparing things in a bit more of an abstract sense as well. It can act as a store of value, a store of uh, something to put your wealth in and uh, carry it over longer distances or leave it lying idle. And it can act as a means of payment, as a way of, uh, of settling debts, of paying taxes. And all of these different functions are, are different roles, different sides of the same coin, if you like, um, in terms of uh, how money uh, works. It, it plays all of these roles simultaneously um, as its function as the, the money commodity. Now, money doesn't arise in a kind of conscious or planned way. It, it arises over, over a period of time, and, uh, and the, the original kind of money commodity can vary, actually, from, from place to place, but always rooted in material conditions. Um, it's uh, like in some places you had kind of herds of cattle would be uh, a money commodity uh, because of the, the important role of, uh, of those animals within uh, society. Um, but obviously uh, there's, there's a, that, that poses certain barriers, if you like, and it's no accident then that actually precious metals become uh, the, the, the main kind of mon money commodity that we, uh, that we know of now and that arise historically. In other words, things like gold and silver, obviously, because they have certain material properties that make them very convenient in the sense that they're homogenous generally. You know, if you have one bit of gold, it's much the same as another. Uh, they're easily divisible. You can divide them up into lots of smaller fragments to be able to pay uh, smaller, make, make smaller transactions. Uh, they're durable in the sense that obviously gold can survive over long distances, over long periods of time. Uh, in that sense, it can be that store of value that I just described. And most importantly, they themselves are very valuable. They are, uh, there's a high, if you like, value density within gold. It, uh, it itself is, actually contains uh, a lot of value. Uh, 
And therefore what you see is that things like gold are not revered in society because they sparkle, because of their aesthetic qualities, but rather we ascribe certain aesthetic qualities to them, certain mystical properties, because they are money. And that's what Marx explained, is that, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the reason there is a love of gold, if you like, uh, in society, uh, is because of its, uh, its material properties that allowed it to arise and be the, the original money commodity. Now, the mystery of money then, as I said, is related to the question of commodity and what I've just touched upon, this question of value, the mystery of value. So really we have to ask ourselves, what is value? Um, how is it determined? And to understand this, we have to go back and examine the idea of a commodity. As I said, a commodity is something, uh, a good or service produced not for individual use or consumption, but for exchange. And, uh, and Marx explains that all commodities have a dual nature, two kind of sides, again, of this uh, coin. Um, they have a use value on the one hand, something that makes them useful in society, a kind of utility, without which there would be no demand for them in the first place on the market. But then there's also an exchange value, a kind of quantitative relationship that uh, tells you how much of one commodity you can exchange for another. And Marx explained that this exchange value, or just value, as he kind of uh, referred to it in general, the value of a commodity is related to the labor time needed to produce it, not just the labor time that goes into that individual commodity, but the socially necessary labor time, he called it, the average amount of time that would go into producing a, 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 good, a given good or service or so forth on the marketplace. Um, and, uh, and this contained both the labor of, of the worker who, uh, or the, 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 the living labor that went into the commodity, but the, also the dead labor, if you like, all the previous labor used to uh, generate the raw materials, the tools and so forth that went into production. Now, prices are just the monetary relationship of uh, the monetary expression, if you like, of value um, determined by supply and demand, determined by the invisible hand, if you like, uh, by these market forces. But they always reflect, really, the relative value of different commodities, the relative socially necessary labor time that, that has gone into things. They, they, the market can obviously play a certain role in, uh, in deviating prices from the value, but they generally will fluctuate around the actual costs of production, the actual socially necessary labor time. In other words, then, prices, uh, this, this monetary expression and, and the value that, it, that underlies that uh, relationship Really, it's a social relationship. It's a relationship between different individuals and the labor that they've put into the, the commodities that they're producing. And I think this key question of uh, this, this idea of, of prices, of value, as being a social relationship is really key to understanding what money is in the most general sense um, and understanding all the different forms that it takes today. The fact is that money then is, is itself a kind of social relation, a relationship between individuals, between individuals and the rest of society. It's a measure, uh, an expression, a representation of value. And the money system that we have, whether it's in terms of coins or credit, you know, numbers on a screen, whatever it may be, is really an expression of the distribution of this value around society. And the money that you or, or I might have have, if you like, you know, often it is, as I say, just numbers on a screen, that, uh, that value, that money, really what it shows is it's an entitlement that we have as individuals to uh, a certain proportion of the wealth within society. That's what money ultimately is. And this also explains why um, there's, uh, there's, you know, things like inflation obviously can, uh, can affect uh, things like this. They, they, it basically is a transfer of wealth from one person to another, uh, a redistribution of the wealth within society. Um, and, uh, and the whole money system that we see around us today is obviously backed up by states. It's backed up by, uh, by the nation state, guaranteeing a currency and, uh, and converting its, uh, these financial relations that we talked about into legal relations, into property relations. No, now, I would say no economist really before Marx really understood this point. Instead, of understanding this, this question of the, 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 the relationships within society, these, this interconnectivity. Instead, they fixated on the different forms that money took and not on the underlying system and the relationships that, that, that those forms represented. 
And, uh, and I would say this really continues today. When you see all these different arguments, uh, you know, either academically or in the press around money, it always ultimately comes down to this, looking at the form and not at the actual content of what money is. So you see often uh, there's, a, there's a debate around whether money is primarily this means of exchange uh, needed for a universal equivalent, or if it's more a unit of account. There's a, a money, th there's a kind of debt theory of money, a credit theory of money, uh, which you hear from people like David Graeber and his book, uh, Debt, 5,000 Years of Money or something, I think it's called. Um, and th there's that debate that goes on. There's, uh, there's a debate about whether to have a more flexible money system of floating currencies or whether to go back to the gold standard as some sort of solution. And then there's uh, those who seek to kind of reform or even revolutionize the current money system by taking away the power of money creation from the banks. And hence why you've had things like Bitcoin invented. And also you see campaigns like positive money that talk about kind of democratizing the banking system. And what I want to focus on really the rest of the talk is to, to look at these kind of questions that have arisen and why it's it really all of them are come about from, from a wrong starting point ultimately in terms of understanding what money is. I think it's very understandable that you have people wanting to kind of smash up the, uh, the banking system, particularly obviously 10 years on from a financial crisis that's left us with a decade of austerity, of crisis, of uh, stagnation and so forth. You know, the effects, obviously, of the financial crisis in 2008, we still feel today. And, uh, and with that financial crisis, you've, you've seen this emergence of the idea that finance is, uh, is the kind of nasty side of capitalism, if you like. But there's a good capitalism that we could return to, you know. If only we separated out the investment banks, uh, we, could, uh, we could reform the banking system, regulate it, and, uh, and focus on uh, real industry, you know, real capitalism. Uh, which is, uh, you know, industry, making things and so forth. But um, what you see is really that, you know, that finance, as I said, the idea of debt, of usury, of lending, all of these sort of things actually come about since the dawn of civilization. They're not some sort of uh, nasty kind of aberration, if you like, of, uh, of capitalism and class society. They're inherently tied within it. In fact, if you look at revolutionary movements in the, in the very early days of uh, society, they always would end up with breaking these tablets upon which the debts were inscribed because that, if you like, was resetting this relationship of uh, this system of saying who owed what and who owned what. And, uh, and, and it was abolishing all the old relations and trying to set a new set of, uh, uh, of social relations. As I said, even in, um, in Mesopotamia, you had this kind of early system of, uh, of, of banking, effectively, where money was being um, kept in, in the temples for safekeeping, and, uh, and people were charged interest uh, as well to, to be able to lend from, uh, from these central stores. International banking develops further with the development of trade. You have uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, Hellenic Greece, and as these places expand in terms of the trade around the Mediterranean, you see the expansion of uh, international banking, the idea of, uh, of people being able to transfer credit between their accounts uh, as merchants, as uh, the, the, the ability to swap coins of different origins that were minted in one place, be able to exchange them for another. And, uh, and all of this kind of international system, if you like, of finance, in the early days, it really grew and grew with the stability of the empires that underlay it. So particularly under the Roman Empire, you see an expansion of uh, this kind of international banking system. And as the Roman Empire collapses, as that stability that the empire provides politically <coughs> collapses, the banking system collapses also and money begins to regress into just a, a whole uh, host of different coins based on different fiefdoms, different kingdoms. And, uh, and these coins in turn would be quite frequently debased by the, uh, by the kings and queens. Uh, and, and actually that kind of process of debasement, of, of, of basically watering down the actual value content within a coin, it, it shows how money increasingly uh, becomes not so much uh, valuable in and of itself, but more and more becomes a symbol of value and, and really is just a representation of a kind of abstract value. Uh, something that is, is objective, but still very uh, uh, abstract. And therefore you have coins and then eventually obviously paper money that, is, that has no real value in and of itself, but represents value. And, uh, and, is, and, and that kind of uh, system 
of, uh, of, of trusting that these things will be accepted <coughs> is obviously set in stone by the state, as I said earlier, and the, uh, the guarantee of the, uh, of, of, of the state. Um, and, and if you like, this process of, of, of debasement, of, uh, of reducing money more and more to a symbol, eventually, you know, the logical result of it really is the system today, where there's very little actual money transferring around in circulation. It's mainly just numbers on a screen. And, uh, and, and, but nevertheless, what we've got to say is that although money um, is, uh, although it, it, it starts to have more and more of a symbolic value, Nevertheless, the, the supply of money in circulation is not arbitrary. It has to be tied to something material. The, uh, at the end of the day, although money is a representation of this value, that in, uh, that, you know, it's a representation of value, it has to be a representation of real value, if you like. It has to be anchored some way to the real economy. And the, and the inability to do that, or, or if you start to rip apart that anchor, then actually you pave the way for, for, for instability, for, for, for crises and so forth. And, uh, and you get inflation, obviously, where the money supply increases, but the actual value in circulation in terms of commodities, uh, if that's not going up at the same rate, then you get inflation. And this is why, really, you can't print your way out of a crisis, if you like. And uh, you obviously see the effects of that in somewhere like Venezuela today or Weimar Germany in the past. You know, it's uh, you can't print your way out of a crisis. The money supply has to be linked to the real value of, uh, of commodities that are in circulation, that are, be that are being produced. And otherwise, uh, you're just debasing your currency, no different from the kings and queens of uh, kind of medieval times. Um, now, we see over hi throughout history that there's a bit of a tension around this question of the money supply that, that comes up repeatedly. As you get the, the re-emergence of, uh, of, of a kind of international trade, the rise of a merchant class and the beginnings of capitalism that we talked about in one of the last sessions, um, you get again that, you know, obviously around the Italian city-states in particular, the re-emergence of this question of international banking. And this emergent uh, rising class was the kind of the beginning of the bourgeoisie who uh, were often lenders to the the old uh, kind of feudal states the the kings and queens and they got a little bit pissed off frankly about the fact that they kept on lending their money to the st to these uh, states uh, but then the the state would default on its debts uh, it would go to war borrow money uh, and then build up huge debts but then just default on them but what you saw is as the, as the merchant class becomes more powerful, as this rising nascent bourgeoisie becomes more powerful, they start to kind of assert that in terms of the, uh, the financial institutions that you see around. And you get the creation of national banks. Uh, the first national bank was the Bank of England in 1694. It's actually a private bank uh, that was created to uh, basically say, you know, to, to take power in terms of the money supply away from, uh, from, the, from the older ruling class and put it in the hands of this new ruling class, the bourgeoisie. Um, and basically it cemented their kind of economic power and guaranteed that state debts would be repaid. And with the creation of national banks, you get national debts as well. You get taxation being used to basically pay for those debts. And, uh, and taxation then becomes a way of trying to channel more money from the, the poorest and the, the, the middle layers in society back towards the top. And uh, Marx famously said that the only, uh, the only thing that's truly commonly owned under capitalism is in fact the national debt. If you, see, if you, you want proof of that, obviously look at the bailout, the banks, and uh, the austerity we see around us today. But basically the, this, uh, this rising bourgeois class gave itself the power to create money and it went even further. It went, it, you, create, you had the creation of uh, what's called fractional reserve banking, which is basically the idea that any private bank can create money effectively. Uh, as, as long as it's got some money in its vaults, it can lend further money out, create new money and lend it out um, with that kind of guarantee, if you like, that they can pay back, uh, pay, 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 pay the, the, the savers back and so forth with money that they've got in their vaults. And the result of that today is that actually 90%, 97% sorry, of the money that's in circulation is not uh, cash and coins and so forth, but is money that's been created by the banks in the form of credit themselves. And so you get this emergence of a, of a massive credit system, which has an important role uh, under capitalism. As I said, 
Finance and credit are not some sort of aberration. They're not the, just the, a simply a nasty side of capitalism. They're an inherent part of capitalism itself. Capitalism, frankly, couldn't have ever come about and couldn't survive without credit. Um, Marx makes this point that actually, you know, in, in the previous talk, uh, we, we heard from uh, Josh about obviously the creation of the working class being an essential part of capitalism. But the creation of, of a credit system was equally important. Why? Well, what, what, we've got to look at what is the role of credit? What is the role of the banking system and, uh, and finance and so forth? On the one hand, very simply, it provides a certain fluidity and dynamism to capitalism. It allows capitalism to continue to circulate. You know, in other words, you don't have to sell all of your goods when you produce in order to then buy more raw materials and carry on production, but rather you can be constantly buying and selling, producing and, uh, and trading all at the same time. So there's that very basic role of kind of overcoming bottlenecks, if you like. But the other thing it also does is, uh, and Marx again wrote about this, is try and overcome the crisis of overproduction within society. Now, I don't have time to really go into a full explanation of Marxist theory of economic crisis, but simply put, the fact that the working class is the, is the, the, the producer of all wealth in society and the fact that profit is the unpaid labor of the working class means you have this inherent contradiction within capitalism where it's always tending to produce more than the market can reabsorb. And the role of credit is to artificially expand the market temporarily in the short term to be able to overcome this contradiction temporarily because obviously credit is always lent out with interest. It has to be paid back. And, uh, and, 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 and all it does is delay, obviously, the crisis until, obviously, a moment like in 2008 when the whole thing comes crashing down. But Marx and later Lenin also emphasized another role within credit, which, which is really fundamental to capitalism, which is that it converts all of the kind of small savings that you've got within the economy. There's lots of small amounts of money all around society. You know, people have individual savings, pensions, and so forth. But well, not all money is capital. Not all money can produce profit. You know, uh, there's a qualitative difference between money and capital, which is money that can create more money, if you like, uh, money that can be put to use to make a profit. And this is what capitalism is about. It's not just simply the existence of money, which, as I say, has existed throughout class society. It's the existence of money concentrated in such sums that it can be put to use to make more money, to be able to make profit. It's got to, it's got to be not just money, but capital. And, uh, and really the role of the credit system is to accumulate all of these bits of small savings. You know, banks obviously, they take our individual savings and we think, oh, how wonderful and nice the bank is. It looks after our money until you find when there's a run on the bank that it doesn't actually sit in the money with a nice little box with your name on it waiting for you to come along and take it out. No, obviously what it's actually being used for is not for our benefit, but to accumulate all our savings that are far too small by themselves to be capital. To, to make a profit and put them together, put them in the hands of the capitalists who can then actually use that money to invest and, uh, and, and invest hopefully in real production. Although obviously at the current time when you've got overproduction, a crisis, a saturation of the markets, then obviously this isn't put to real use but is instead uh, speculatively used. And we'll come on to that a bit more. In other words, what the credit system really does Far from democratizing capitalism, you hear this sometimes today, all oh, shares and, uh, and, the, and all of these sorts of things, you know, allows everyone to be a capitalist. You know, if you've got a pension, you are a capitalist because you've got your pension invested in shares. So you're a capitalist. It's, it's absolute nonsense. And the point is, actually, it's the opposite. It doesn't democratize capitalism. It centralizes power more and more in the hands of the banks, of the financiers. And as Lenin said as imperialism, these become closer and closer and meshed with the big monopolies and you get the epoch of, of kind of finance capital. Um, so really you see how then the, the role of credit is it's an essential part of capitalism. But it obviously with this uh, with this create, you know, this ability to create money out of nothing, seemingly, you obviously break that link between the money supply and the real economy. And it, it sows the seeds, therefore, for potential uh, crises in the future where uh, the money supply that's out there, the, 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 the prices of things, ceases to play any real representation of the actual value in society. You have a stock market now that's booming. Meanwhile, real wages are completely stagnant. And this, this all is really paving the way for, for bigger crises. And, uh, and it all comes down 
to that essential uh, turning point when money can kind of be created out of nothing. And that's why you see at certain points in history a desire for something much more tangible in terms of money, something solid that, that people can hold on to. You know, when there's a crisis, people want an actual commodity, particularly something like gold, obviously, that they can pour their money into because it feels real. And, uh, and that's why over history you do get these kind of alternating periods between where money expands on the back of a stable political situation, a stable economic situation, the money supply expands, everyone trusts everyone, and there's an expansion of credit and, and so forth. But then when suddenly things start turning into their opposite, the whole thing contracts very rapidly and you get the credit crunch. And that's a very important point that Marx emphasized, is that it's not the lack of credit that causes the crisis, but rather the crisis of capitalism that causes people to suddenly withdraw the credit, which obviously then fuels and exacerbates the crisis further. Now, you see this kind of craving for, for, for gold, something tangible, you see it uh, eventually turn into the gold standard. In the 19th century in Britain, you have uh, money starting to be tied, the money supply being tied to gold. And the reason it was brought in is because on the back of the Napoleonic Wars, you had this uh, huge inflation of government debts and, uh, and as I said, people didn't want uh, these debts to get higher. They didn't want these debts to be defaulted on. And there was rampant inflation. And so the gold standard was brought in to try and uh, restrict the money supply. And on the back of the British Empire, again, providing that kind of international stability, it started to export the gold standard across the world until you had an international gold standard, allowing currencies of different uh, origins to be uh, obviously tied all to, to, to the gold. And this became an enormous boost actually to world trade, it allowed a much more simple facilitation of trade. But ultimately it was on the back of the British Empire. The real benefit of it was British capitalism itself. The gold standard ended up being uh, unstuck in the First World War, again, because of the crisis that was uh, taking place. You had suddenly you know, a, a situation where having ha previously had all the economies in the world kind of moving in the same direction, 30 years of boom of capitalism where everyone was getting better, Suddenly, the whole thing went into reverse, and with the First World War and the crisis that ensued afterwards, you had instead uh, kind of beggar thy neighbor policies being brought in, the, the, the contradictions of the nation state emerging, and different economies moving in different directions, trying to pull against each other, and obviously then the gold standard coming unstuck. You had basically different countries were trying to export the crisis and wanted to come off the gold standard so that they could competitively devalue their currencies, in particular, Britain was, uh, was very guilty of this. The, 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 the pound was far overvalued. And uh, the result of this, because they were tied to the gold standard, was that they had to do what was called internal devaluation. And so you saw enormous attacks on the working class in Britain. As British capitalism was declining in terms of its competitiveness relative to America and Germany and Japan and these emerging capitalist powers, Britain uh, could only maintain its position on the world stage tied what, what within the system of the gold standard if it attacked the working class. And that obviously created enormous social instability. It's really the basis behind some of the massive strikes, including the 1926 general strike that you see in Britain in that period. And eventually, once you get the Great Depression and the big crash of 1929, the whole system really falls apart. And, uh, and, and one country after another comes off the gold standard in order to be able to fuel its money supply, fuel the banks, um, increase liquidity and so forth. And, uh, and eventually the whole thing collapses, uh, as I said. After the Second World War, when, when, when you start to have stability kind of restored, if you like, um, you get uh, the establishment of what's called the Bretton Woods system, which effectively was like the gold standard, because now you, you had all the currencies pegged to something, but it wasn't gold, it was the dollar. And that was because obviously by that point, America had become the dominant world superpower playing the role that Britain had done in the 19th century. And it's the American empire, if you like, that guaranteed the kind of stability of the system. And, uh, and what you had was uh, currencies all pegged to the dollar, but the dollar effectively was as good as gold. Two thirds of the world's gold lay in Fort Knox. And, uh, and if you did international trade, it was just moved from one bit of the Fort Knox to another, basically. And that represented uh, the, uh, the international trade, if you like. Um, now, as I say, that could really only be implemented because of the hegemonic kind of imperialist position that the U.S. occupied after the Second World War, provided a certain stability to world trade. And you see an ex a massive expansion of world trade. But ultimately, what underlay that 
was the post-war boom and the massive economic stability that that provided. Uh, and as the, the, the economic boom slowed down, as the kind of Keynesian measures that were used to try and manage capitalism, uh, start, as the contradictions of those started to develop, what you saw was the, the money system also, again, once again, coming under strain. And so, uh, in particular, what you had was uh, inflation in the US because of the war in Vietnam, because of Keynesian policies, massive public spending. That eventually fed through into inflation, as I said, because the money supply was, was, was accelerating faster than the actual uh, strength of the economy. And, uh, and that inflation was then exported across the world because of the, the Bretton Woods system. And then it's finally in the 1970s with the, with the world crisis that comes into, uh, in, into play in 1973. You have the oil crisis. It tips the whole system over the edge and, uh, and Bretton Woods completely collapses. Um, and uh, there's a move instead at that point to floating currencies where basically exchange rates are now uh, automatic based on the different um, supply and demand for different currencies, which in turn reflects the different strength of those different economies. So the different competitivenesses of different economies is reflected in the strength of their currencies. If the, if the currency is strong, it reflects the, 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 the strength of that economy and the demand to be able to, uh, to have that currency so you can buy the exports uh, from that particular country and vice versa. But the whole idea was that, was, is that through this you would get some sort of automatic regulation of the financial system, of the currency system, where as countries became less competitive, they would obviously, their currencies would devalue, their exports would increase and they would rebalance. Obviously, when that process happened, the working class in that country would pay through obviously higher prices of imports and so forth. So whichever way you look at it, under capitalism, it was always the working class that was going to be paying for. And ultimately, it, it's, it's, it's an unstable system. Again, it can, it can last for a certain period when the economy is booming. But in a period of crisis, suddenly again, the nation state reemerges as this contradiction and all the different economies are pulling in different directions. You get this uh, idea now that in Greece, for example, where they're still kind of effectively in a gold standard, only it's called the Eurozone, um, they've got to somehow export their way out the crisis by this inter internal devaluation. But the problem with this whole idea of you know, being more competitive is that competitive is, competitiveness is ultimately a relative quantity. We can't all be the most competitive. Someone's got to be first, someone's got to be last. If it's America first, it's the rest of us last, uh, in, in kind of Trumpian speak. Um, and, uh, and that's why we see how the limits of the gold standard have re-emerged, as I say, with the euro crisis. But what I've really outlined here in this kind of development of the money system the international money system, is that every, over the last 100 years in particular, every money system has at a certain point reached a crisis point where the whole system is kind of broken apart and, and a new system has to be brought into place. Um, and it's always coming on the back, not of, of the money crisis first, but rather it's the crisis of capitalism first that then expresses itself in a crisis of the money system. You initially have a source of, uh, of economic stability, of political stability, that facilitates the growth of trade, of the market and so forth. But eventually all of that will turn into its opposite. The money system then, instead of becoming a, a facilitator of world trade, actually ends up being uh, some, a facilitator of contradictions, of antagonisms between different countries. And, uh, and it then actually fuels instability rather than stability. And that's what you really see with the Eurozone now. That, that for a certain period when everyone was moving in the same direction, it was great. It was great particularly for the German banks, but you know, no one was complaining when the Greeks borrowed more uh, either because it meant them borrowing to buy German cars. Now, uh, you know, eventually that turns into its opposite and now you see how the Euro has become this great albatross around the necks, particularly of the least competitive countries, the Spains, the Italys, the, uh, the, the Portugals and the Greeces and so forth. Who, uh, who, who can't find a way out within this uh, straitjacket. But the, but the real point to emphasize here is it's not the euro that is the problem. It's the crisis of capitalism that expresses itself through a crisis of the eurozone. Whether you're inside the euro or outside the euro, the problems are, are ultimately that, that, that Greek capitalism cannot compete on a world scale. And the only way that these countries can really compete What's really the aim of, uh, of all the policies of the IMF and the Eurozone and so forth is really to try and bring the kind of the, the competitive conditions of places like China over to Europe. That's what it really means 
when you talk about competitiveness. It's to, a race to the bottom uh, in the favor of the capitalists themselves. Um, but as I say, at a certain point, every money system really hit, hits a wall. And then you get this kind of paradigm shift, if you like, where they move from one monetary system to another. Uh, and all of these, the gold standard, Bretton Woods, floating currencies, all of these really are only a reflection, the crisis of them, are only a reflection of the general crisis of capitalism, which, which suddenly exposes all the flaws and the weakness. But the underlying crisis is, is the root of the problem. And that's really why the ruling class doesn't have any solutions to today, because obviously they fundamentally defend the capitalist system and they, they have no way out on a, on a kind of monetary basis. You, you see actually now the limits of, of uh, kind of monetary solutions to the crisis. In the past, you would lower interest rates, but now that's they're, they're at rock bottom, they're at zero. There's no way of really uh, of, of, of encouraging more lending along those lines. And hence why you have desperate measures like quantitative easing, um, at which uh, even then is not some sort of uh, magic wand that they thought it might be originally. They, for a while, they thought quantitative easing in Europe and America and elsewhere had stabilized the economies. What no one was really seeing was that whilst it was giving a certain stability for a certain period of time in certain places, it was meanwhile leaking out into the emerging economies, fueling credit bubbles there. And now, obviously, with the crisis in Turkey and Argentina and elsewhere, you see the, uh, the chickens coming home to roost. There's no free lunch under capitalism, if you like. It will always, at some point, come back to bite you. And, uh, and this is why, just to, uh, the final part, I just want to really emphasize um, this, uh, this question of how all of these things that are now proposed by uh, different people who want to try and overcome these uh, limits, they're always ultimately attacking symptoms, but never this root problem. Um, you know, you've heard to talk about returning to the gold standard. As I said, you've heard uh, campaigns like Positive Money talking about democratizing the banks. Um, but, you know, what they forget really is that, that bank lending isn't just out of control because of greedy bankers, but is in response to the demands of capitalism, the insatiable demands of capitalism to find bigger and bigger markets, you know? Um, and, uh, and the fact that there's a lack of investment in real production is because of the crisis of overproduction. It's because of the crisis of capitalism. And you can't bring that under control by some sort of abstract idea of democratizing the banks and taking money creation out of the, the power. Um, and uh, on the other side, we get to the question of of uh, these cryptocurrencies, you know, people like Bitcoin, for example, which uh, are a kind of anarcho-libertarian response to the fact that at the moment the state and and the central banks that are part of the state ultimately um, have all the power in terms of money creation, and uh, and it's no surprise that when you've had things like quantitative easing that have massively increased the money supply, there is a certain fear about the fact that the government can just print money as it likes. Um, and hence the creation of things like Bitcoin. They're, they're an attempt to, to basically distribute the money uh, supply. And, uh, and so what you have really, in summary, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, instead of having one kind of centralized uh, system of money creation and one copy of all the transactions that are going on in the central bank, instead that's distributed. It's a distributed ledger, it's called. E electronically distributed, digitally distributed, and something called the blockchain. And, uh, and new money, new cryptocurrencies created by people called miners who perform calculations uh, and, uh, and update the blockchain. And uh, Bitcoin has, has actually arisen and Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have, have led to multiple problems. First off, the, that question of mining is actually a huge problem. Mining real resources damages the environment. Well, mining cryptocurrency does too because it actually creates an, it's an enormous amount of uh, uh, energy and electricity goes into creating new Bitcoin. And it's mainly focused now in places like China where electricity is very cheap and you've got huge like, amounts of terawatts being produced or being used just to kind of mine this, this, this digital currency that isn't really then used for anything other than buying off the, uh, the Silk Road and things like that, you know, uh, for all these kind of illegal produce. And the fact that that's what Bitcoin's really limited to is these kind of fringe economic activities means it can never really play the role of, of a genuine currency. It doesn't have any real economic anchor. And instead, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have just become a vehicle for speculation. In other words, people buy them just in the hope that their price is going to go up and they can sell them later. It's no fundamentally different from things like the tulip bulb craze uh, 
where uh, I can't remember which century it was, it was in Holland, people bought tulip bulbs just because they would hope that they would get uh, more and more expensive. Um, and, uh, and that's really the, the, the definition of speculation. But the fact that you've got all this speculation, the prices go up and down daily, uh, so volatile, makes it very difficult as a money to use as money. You know, the fact that if you were in a shop and you had your things priced in Bitcoin, you'd be having to go around constantly uh, changing your prices um, every day because uh, and every hour even because of the volatility of the currency. So it doesn't really play a viable role um, because you do kind of need that and un under capitalism particularly. You, you kind of need that trust, if you like, that the state creates in uh, the money system. Um, and, uh, and, and really the problem isn't the meddling of the central banks, but it's the anarchy of the capitalist system. And things like Bitcoin under capitalism will always be a kind of utopian experiment. So really the question has to be how, like, if you want to get rid of the kind of evils of money, you know, if, if money is the root of all evil, uh, and, and how do you get rid of it? Well, it's to get rid of, obviously, the disease itself that underlines all these pernicious symptoms. But money can't be just abolished. You know, it can't just be uh, waved away. As I said, it historically rises because of certain material conditions, because of commodity production and exchange. And that, in turn, is tied to the question of private ownership. Money represents value, and value arises out of uh, private property and production for, 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 for exchange. To get rid of money then, really, as I said, you need to go back to what Marx said. You need to solve that. If you want to get rid of the money fetish, you need to get rid of the commodity fetish. You need to get rid of the system of commodity production and exchange. And that means going back to a kind of communist society, but on a much higher level, where we've got the tools and the technology and the wealth for uh, superabundance. But money even then will not just be abolished, but it will wither away, uh, was what Marx and Engels and Lenin uh, analysed like the state, like class society, these things will wither away over time. There will be a certain transitional period from, uh, from socialism, the lower form of communism, to, to the higher stage of communism, which begin with the working class seizing power, with the working class uh, taking the key levers of the economy into common ownership under a democratic socialist plan of production. And as more and more of the economy is integrated into a socialist plan, less and less will be uh, commodity production exchange and less and less will there be need for money. All the products of labor will be socially owned and they will cease to be commodities. And in fact, you can already see how this might play out under capitalism. You know, we have a system like the NHS, for example, where you don't walk in and have to pay any money apart from for certain things. But the point is that why not, if you had that same principle expanded to food, to housing, to transport, why could you not take one sector after another out of this system of commodity production exchange, out of the market, and with it, reduce the need for any monetary interactions? Um, and in fact, Trotsky analyzed this uh, by talking about how, at the end of the day, we all receive kind of two wages. We receive an actual income for our, for our work, a, a wage, but you also have a social wage, the kind of the wage that you never see because of the social uh, services, the public services that are provided uh, within the, the state and so forth. And uh, the whole point of, of the transition from socialism to communism would be to decrease the actual money wage and increase the social wage over time until eventually you, there was no actual physical wage that you saw at all. And money itself would just become kind of mere tokens entitling us to a share of the common pot, basically. And uh, it would be kind of like rationing in the Second World War only on a much higher level. Rationing was because of scarcity and people were given tokens entitling them to a certain amount of fruit and uh, bread and so forth. But now imagine that on a much higher level where there's super abundance, where it's not rationing, but rather it's just saying if you work, if you're a member of society, uh, and, and, and then, then, you can, uh, then you can take from the common pot. And eventually we'll have uh, a system where all scarcity is eliminated. The need for tokens themselves will be eliminated. We can just walk into the shops that are around, take what we need, not full in the knowledge that tomorrow that will be uh, replaced. And we'll have effectively Marx's maxim that said, from each according to their ability, to each according to their needs. Now, I just want to leave uh, this discussion, uh, leave the final word to Leon Trotsky, the Russian Revolution, who said, money cannot arbitrarily be abolished. It must exhaust its historic mission, evaporate and fall away. The death blow to money fetishism 
be struck only upon that stage when the steady growth of social wealth has made us bipeds forget our miserly attitude towards every excess minute of labour, our, humi our humiliating fear about the size of our ration. Having lost its ability to bring happiness or trample men in the dust, money will turn into mere bookkeeping receipts for the convenience of statisticians and for planning purposes. In the still more distant future, probably these receipts will not be needed either. But we can leave this question entirely to posterity, who will be more intelligent than we are. And that's what we're fighting for.